Right, it's recording. So, welcome everyone to another meeting of Symmetry in Newcastle. Um, our guest today is Michael Widmer from the Technical University in Graz in Austria, and he'll deliver two talks. First one will be sort of introductory and the talk on the topic of different algebraic groups. Okay, yeah, so thanks a lot for the introduction and uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. So I'll talk about different algebraic groups and those are a generalization of algebraic groups. So roughly algebraic groups, you can say it's uh, groups defined by nonlinear algebraic equations. And then so different algebraic groups, you can think of them as groups being defined by nonlinear difference algebraic equations. Okay, so it it will definitely it definitely would be helpful to know a little bit about algebraic groups for understanding this talk, but I'll try to present things in such a way that it's uh, understandable, hopefully for for everyone, even if you don't have a, a background in this area. So here's the the outline of the of the talk. Um, our first. Yeah, in the first section, I'll just, uh, I'll try to somehow formally explain in detail what do we even mean by a difference equation. And so, yeah, you can roughly think of it as a discrete version of a differential equation. And so I'll, I'll try to just explain the, the basics of what we call uh, difference algebra and difference algebraic geometry. So roughly the idea here is that, well, Algebraic geometry and commutative algebra are somehow um, the main tools to study, um, or at least provide tools to study nonlinear systems of algebraic equations. And so in difference algebra and in difference algebraic geometry, we try to do the, the same things, but for uh, difference equations. Okay, and so then in the second part, I'll introduce difference algebraic groups. Uh, give some examples, and then in the last part about almost simple difference algebraic groups, I'll uh, present some some first results about difference algebraic groups. About the goal is to, well, ultimately the a big goal in the area would be to classify difference algebraic groups, somewhat similar to the way um, algebraic groups are classified. Uh, but so here is is an, somehow a first. Uh, rather weak uh, structure theory for general uh, difference algebraic groups. Okay, so I'll start with the um, very basics of uh, difference algebra. And so here's the, the two founders of uh, difference algebra, I would say. So the, the first uh, one who somehow formally introduced uh, difference algebra is, was uh, Joseph Ritt. And then he had uh, student Richard Cohn. And so he died in 2014, but I was uh, lucky enough to at least uh, meet him, him once. And so Richard Cohn, he wrote uh, the first book on difference algebra and is, uh, now there already exists uh, a second book, but so it's, um, his book is still a very nice read and uh, even though it's a little outdated, but it's definitely been a, a very influential book in the, in the area. Okay, so let me now start with the, with the basics, so a difference ring is a commutative ring together with a ring endomorphism. So that's just the definition. And so by the way, all rings in this talk will always be commutative. And so the, the endomorphism is uh, typically called sigma. So, and so for, for, for short, we also talk, just talk of a sigma ring sometimes. Okay. So like commutative rings are the basic objects in commutative algebra. So difference rings are the basic objects in uh, difference algebra. And so an example would be, if you look at the ring of all functions uh, from the complex numbers to the complex numbers. And so this is a ring on a bondwise uh, addition and the multiplication. And here you can define sigma as the so-called shift. So you map f of x to f of x plus one, or if you're interested in so what they call Q difference equations, then you would be mapping uh, f of x to f of q times x, where q is some non-zero complex number. Another somehow fairly standard and important example would be the 
ring of all sequences of complex numbers. So this is a ring under uh, component wise addition and multiplication of sequences. So this is a ring. It has a lot of zero divisors. Um, but anyway, it's, it's still a somehow nice, nice ring. And uh, so here you take sigma as uh, the shift. So you take a sequence of complex numbers, a n, and then you shift this sequence one step to the left. So that is uh, a ring endomorphism. Okay. And yeah, so you may be wondering, okay, why are you calling this a difference ring? Why you don't just call it the ring with an endomorphism, if that's what it is? Um, I think, as far as I know, that this naming of difference, it somehow comes historically from this, uh, this minus here in this, in this expression. So when you're dealing with this somehow classical um, shift operator sending f of x to f of x plus one, then it's um, often somehow maybe more natural to rewrite equations, not using the shift, but rewrite equations um, using this operator that sends the function f to f of x plus one minus f of x. Because this operator, you can really think of it is more like a discrete version of, uh, of a derivation. Like if you divide by one you somehow, then this, and then if, if you think that one is small, then in the limit, this would actually be the, the, the definition of the derivative of f, right? So um, yeah, that, and so this is, is I guess, the, the um, historical reasons why we're calling, why we're using this word difference all over the place. Okay. And so a morphism of difference rings is, uh, is what you think it is. So it's just a morphism of rings that commutes with uh, the action of sigma. And so um, it's somehow standard to abuse notation in the sense that all endomorphisms in this talk will just always be called sigma. It would be more correct, I guess, to formally put, maybe you want to put an R below the sigma to emphasize this is the sigma that's acting on R, but somehow is, uh, it's not necessary to really do this because everything is always assumed to be compatible with this different structure. And so we don't need to be really careful about this. Okay. Yeah, so maybe just to give an example of a morphism of different rings, you can map, so this is just a univariate polynomial ring. And uh, so in one variable X, and then I take this polynomial and I evaluate it <clears throat> at the set of all integers. And so this is first of all, a morphism of uh, rings. And I'm also claiming that it's a morphism of difference rings. And so to make uh, sense of this, I should also tell you exactly what are the sigmas on both of those rings. Well, the sigma on the ring of sequences is the one I already introduced up here. And the sigma on the polynomial ring would also be uh, the shift. And so to see that this is a morphism of different rings. Well, if you take a polynomial and then you apply a sigma first, and then you evaluate it at the, all the natural numbers, you get the sequence f of n plus one. And then if you first apply the map um, and then you do the shift, uh, you also get um, the sequence of, uh, uh, f of n plus one. Okay, so this is then in fact a morphism of, of difference rings. Okay, so a difference field is also what you think it is. It's uh, just then a field together with a ring endomorphism. So a, a difference field is just a difference ring such that the underlying ring is, uh, is a field. A typically example would be the field of uh, rational functions. And so throughout the talk now, uh, this uh, little k will always be a, a difference field. So rational functions, again, with this, those same, uh, same two operations we had before, either you're shifting or you're multiplying uh, the variable with uh, a non-zero complex number q. And then finally, um, probably the last of those uh, general algebra definitions, what is uh, a difference algebra? Uh, for sure, the K sigma algebra. So fix a difference field K, then um, K sigma algebra is um, 
Well, one way to say it is that it's a, it's a K algebra equipped with an endomorphism sigma such that the sigma on R extends the, the sigma on K. Another way to say it is that it's just a amorphism, uh, uh, sorry, it's just, a, it's a K algebra such that the K algebra structure map from R to K is a morphism of, of difference rings. And then of course, you also have a very natural notion of morphism between uh, K sigma algebras. So maybe uh, an example of a K sigma algebra here is that if you take the difference field as above, um, the rational function field, say with the, with the shift, and then you can take as, uh, as uh, R, the, uh, say the field of all meromorphic functions on C, again with the, with the shift. So that would be an example of a K sigma algebra. All right, so this is somehow the, that was just the algebraic preliminaries. Um, so you have all these different versions of the usual concepts in, in algebra. And so the main point of, um, of doing this um, is to have uh, tools to study systems of algebraic difference equations. So here is uh, just an, an example of what we would call a system of algebraic difference equations. So here is you have two difference equations in two unknowns. So the unknowns are y and c. And yeah, so you have you also somehow allow those formal powers of sigma in the in the equations. So in this sense, a system of algebraic difference equations is exactly the same as a system of uh, algebraic differential equations, it's just that you're writing sigma instead of a derivation. Okay. And so the sigma really is just a placeholder, if you want, for a, a ring endomorphism. So the central topic in, in difference algebra and in difference algebraic geometry is to study the solution sets of these uh, equations. Or if you want, maybe just study these equations uh, themselves. And so if you want to make sense of what is uh, a solution to such a system, well, you have to plug in something for the Y, and then you have to plug in something for the C, but then you also need to plug in something for the Sigma. Okay. So let's do this on the example. So if you plug in cosine of X for Y, and sine of x for c. And then you also need to plug in something for sigma. And let's say sigma is acting like this. So this is like the q difference operator for q equals 2. So sending f of x to f of 2x. Then so if you take the second equation, the short equation, then now I plug in uh, for c. I'm supposed to plug in sine of, of x. And then for sigma, I plug in this operator. Then sigma of c becomes sine of 2x. And then so for, well, for y, I'm plugging in the cosine and for z, I'm plugging in sine. So I get this expression and this is a well-known trigonomic identity. And so this is, uh, so this is true. So we see that um, cosine of x and sine of x is indeed a solution of the, of the second um, difference equation. And uh, quite similar, so I'm not going to do it for the first one is uh, just too, uh, too much work, but it's, there's also just some, some basic trigonometric identities hidden in this uh, first equation. So if one really wanted to, you can also check that uh, cosine of x and sine of x is also a solution to the first uh, difference equation. Okay. But I could also, um, so this is when you're looking for solutions, say in uh, some kind of field of or ring of functions, uh, but you can also look for solutions to this system in, in other places. For example, a fairly natural place to look at is the ring of sequences, which we already encountered earlier. And so here, now if I plug in uh, for y, uh, just any sequence of complex numbers, and for z, also I plug in any sequence of complex numbers, and then for sigma, I plug in the shift operator as we had it earlier. 
then this system of difference equations, somehow with the abstract signals, it gets rewritten uh, in this form. Okay, so to go from the above uh, to this form, all you have to, to do is, well, so you, um, you delete the, somehow the, the sigmas and you put an index there, but the power of, of sigma goes into the shift. So for example, sigma to the five of y becomes yn plus five. And here sigma to the four of c becomes cn plus four and so on. And so, but you see this, this process is reversible. Um, so you can also then you be able to go back from this form of the equation um, of writing the equation, you can also go go back to introducing the, the abstract signals. And so this this kind of way of writing difference equations is probably um, what is uh, familiar to, to many people. So in fact, if you, it may, may be more familiar somehow. In fact, if you Google difference equations, then typically um, most of the results are really about equations of, uh, of this form where you looking at, uh, at sequences. And of course, also in terms of applications, difference um, like applied applications, real, real world, relevant to the real world, this kind of uh, systems are of course uh, rather important. So for example, if you're um, studying PDEs numerically, then often people discretize um, the, the PDEs and then you get um, equations uh, like this. Okay, but so in, in difference algebra, in difference algebraic geometry, we are not so much interested in solutions in, uh, very, in, in one particular ring somehow. We are more interested just in solutions very abstractly, generally, basically wherever we can, can find them. So let's, let me try. So these expressions here um, we use to describe the system. Those are called difference polynomials. And so let me try to introduce them a little bit more formally. So from now on, let's always just fix a difference field and we'll work over this difference field K. This is somewhat similar to in algebraic geometry. Usually people fix a field and then they consider nonlinear algebraic equations over that field. Okay, so the difference polynomial ring over this difference field is denoted like this, okay, and then curly brackets y. Um, so I'll have here n variables y1 up to yn. And so this is a polynomial ring. So just as a ring, it's a polynomial ring in infinitely many variables, y1 up to yn, and then sigma y1, sigma, y, sigma yn, and so on. So infinitely many variables. And then there is somehow a natural action of sigma on this ring as it is suggested by the names of the variables. So on K, I already have my sigma and I extend it on a difference polynomial ring by, by this very natural thing by, yeah, as it is suggested by the names of the variable. So sigma is really just somehow the shift on, on the variables. And then so the difference polynomial is ring is then a, a K sigma algebra. And so take any set of difference polynomials, say F, and whenever you have uh, a set of difference polynomials, you can make sense of their solutions in any K sigma algebra. And so this is what we call V sub R of F. V sub R of F is all points in R to the N, such that f of a vanishes for all f in, uh, in f, okay? So this is really the set of solutions of the nonlinear system of algebraic difference equations given by f in the K-sigma algebra. Okay, so to be maybe a little more concrete again. So going back to the, um, the examples we had earlier, so the, the equations we had earlier too. So if I say, okay, my base field K is the field of Russian functions. And if I say my K sigma algebra R is say the field of meromorphic functions, sigma is the shift. And then um, we've seen earlier that um, cosine of X and sine of X is, uh, oh, no, uh, oh, I did a mistake here. So here the, the sigma should be 
f of x is f of 2x. Sorry about that. So and then we've seen earlier that in this setup, the cosine of x and sine of x is a solution of the system. And so somehow using this notation from above, I can somehow maybe just may more conveniently just say, OK, cosine of x and sine of x is an element of this uh, solution set. Okay. Yeah, so there are definitely people that care really about solutions of different equations to maybe rather specific equations in very specific rings, like uh, rings of sequences or a certain, uh, in certain classes of, of functions. But in, in difference algebra, um, we typically don't care so much about specific k sigma algebras. This is somewhat similar to, to what happens in, say, algebraic geometry. So if you're looking at nonlinear algebraic equations, say, over the field of rational uh, numbers, then if you're only looking for solutions in the field of rational numbers, this is just an extremely difficult problem. And uh, there is, uh, in general, not so much you can say for a general uh, nonlinear system. Uh, but if you're looking, say, for points in the algebraic closure or for points wherever, basically you just allow points wherever, then this is somehow how you do algebraic geometry. And there's a lot of uh, it's notions and, and tools available when you just allow yourself to look for solutions everywhere, let's say and not be too restrictive about where you're looking for solutions. So you wanna have a setup where you're somehow able to recover the equations from the solutions. And so this is something that's typically formulated as some kind of, of Nullstellensatz. And typically in algebraic geometry, people just look in the, for the algebraic closure, for solutions in the algebraic closure of the base field. But so here in difference algebra, there isn't really a notion of a difference closure of a difference field. So the way we do it is um, we just allow arbitrary k sigma algebras um, somehow to look for solutions. Okay, so this is now is a central definition of uh, difference algebra. What is a, a difference algebraic geometry, let's say? So what is a, a difference variety? So on an intuitive level, you should just think of it as the set of solutions to a nonlinear system of algebraic difference equations. But as I said, somehow to make this precise, you need to say, where are we looking for the solution? And we don't really want to specify where we are looking for the solutions. And so the way we do it is we just say, oh, we're allowing, to look our, we're allowing ourselves to look for solutions in any k sigma algebra. And so then if you somehow put those solution sets, um, for every k sigma algebra, if you put those things together, what you naturally get is a functor. Okay, so we then just say, okay, a functor x from the category of k sigma algebras to the category of sets is a sigma variety if it is of this form. So if it is somehow the solution set of uh, some um, nonlinear system of algebraic difference equations. Okay. So that's, that's the definition of a difference variety. So this somehow now formalizes what, what I mean when, when we say um, that we're looking for solutions of uh, nonlinear systems of algebraic difference equations. Michael, can I quickly ask? Yep. Mm -hmm. So in that definition, the the n the number of variables that we had previously is that allowed to be anything then yes yes that's a good question yes so it's uh, it's not uh, it's not fixed yeah okay. it it could change yeah mm -hmm. right. yeah in in fact somehow if somehow if you, you fix the n then you would maybe you want to call this then somehow a different uh, sub variety of uh, a fine n space mm. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so now assume we have such a, a difference variety now. Think of it as the solution set of uh, some system of difference polynomials. Then I can look at all difference polynomials that vanish at, 
on that uh, solution set. So this is then what we call this I of X, all difference polynomials that vanish at all solutions, at all, at all points of the difference variety. And so this is, and so one can check that this is an ideal in a difference polynomial ring, but it's not just an ideal. It's what we call a difference ideal or a sigma ideal, meaning that it's stable under sigma. So sigma will map this ideal into itself. And then because you have this difference ideal property, the quotient, so you can always take the quotient by, by a ring by an ideal, and then this is going to be a, a ring again. And then, but because it's a difference ideal, this is naturally also a difference ring. And in fact, so this quotient is naturally a K-sigma algebra. So to my difference variety, I can, via this construction, associate a, a difference algebra, a K-sigma algebra. And you can think of this K-sigma algebra somehow as the, the ring of functions on my uh, difference variety. Uh, sometimes, so this is also called uh, a difference coordinate ring. So this is very similar to what people do in algebraic geometry, maybe more precisely a fine algebraic geometry. So if you have an, a fine variety, so the solution set of uh, uh, some nonlinear polynomial equations, then you look at all the polynomials that vanish on the variety and then the quotient um, of the polynomial ring by this vanishing idea is then the coordinate ring of the affine variety. And so this is some different version of this uh, well-known construction. And so it's a fair question somehow which difference algebras occur here as those difference coordinates ring. And it's, it's not that all difference algebras occur. They have a, a, a certain property which is called finitely being finitely difference generated or finitely single generated. Okay, so this is an, 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 a definition that will also be used later on. So we say that a K sigma algebra R is finitely sigma generated if there exists a finite subset B such that as an algebra, R is generated by B, sigma of B, sigma squared of B, and so on. Okay, so R may not be finitely generated as a K algebra, but it's somehow finally generated in this different sense. So you can describe it through this finite set B and, and uh, iterations of sigma. Another way to say it would be to say that R can be written as a quotient of some difference polynomial ring in finitely many variables. Okay. And so then there is uh, an equivalence of categories between um, difference variety did you just mute yourself somehow Michael Okay, sorry. So I, I, I'm back again. Yeah. Maybe the video, the video is gone. I was just trying. Oh yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I think I muted myself. I was just trying to move this kind of uh, black thing here out of uh, my way. Okay. I think it's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So there is an equivalence of categories between different varieties and finitely generated. Um, K sigma algebras. Okay, so it's given by this construction of uh, the difference coordinate ring. So the moral is simply that all the information <clears throat> contained in my difference variety is can be encoded in this purely algebraic structure of a finitely generated difference algebra. Okay. All right, so now that was. Um, the the first section so let me move on now to uh, different algebraic groups so you can probably guess what it is at, at this point so a different algebraic group <clears throat> is then just uh, a difference variety with a group structure maybe 
more formally, we could say it's a, it's a group object in the category of uh, difference varieties. So here's um, some examples. So um, linear algebraic groups, so subgroups of the general linear group defined by algebraic difference equations are um, so sorry, defined by just algebraic equations um, are examples of different algebraic groups just because um, algebraic equations are examples of uh, algebraic difference equations. Okay. So in this sense, different algebraic groups are generalization of algebraic groups. Here's another example. If you look at all um, matrices in SL2, so here R is always a K sigma algebra. K throughout is a fixed difference field. Everything is over K. So you could also say a different algebraic group over K in the definition here. So you look at all matrices in SL2 such that, uh, so sigma is here applied to every coordinate of the matrix, such that the entries of um, the matrix are fixed by sigma. Okay, you can immediately check that this is, uh, is a subgroup. And so then this is uh, a different algebraic group. Another example would be if, so this would be an example of what we call a different algebraic subgroup of the multiplicative group. So the multiplicative algebraic group, if you give it a ring, it just outputs the multiplicative group of, of the green. So the, the group of units. And also if you take the group of units of uh, the difference so of the K sigma algebra, and you, you don't want to take all units, you take all those satisfying this equation. So G times sigma squared of G to the, uh, so cubed is one. But so, and you can then immediately check that this is a subgroup. And so this is in fact a different algebraic group. And so the, those, those exponents here are really completely random. You could also put a seven instead of the three and a five instead of a two. And you could even make a, a longer product here and Whatever you put here, if, as long as you have some kind of multiplicative product here of sigmas and exponents, then this will always be a, a difference algebraic group. Another example would be a difference algebraic subgroup of the additive group. So the additive algebraic group, it takes a ring and then just gives you back the underlying additive group of, of that ring. So here the lambdas are uh, elements of our base difference field K. And so this is here a nonlinear, uh, sorry, this is here an, a linear, this is a linear difference equation, homogeneous linear difference equation. And as you um, probably know, at least from the, uh, for differential equations, I'm sure you, you've, you're familiar, at least if you have taught maybe calculus recently, that if you take a linear homogeneous differential equation, then the solutions are vector space. So in particular, if you add two solutions, then this is, uh, you again have a solution. So this is something similar holds for difference equations. So if you add two solutions of a linear uh, equation, then you again have a solution. And so the same is if you multiply a solution with a, say with minus one, then you still have a solution. So this shows that the solution set is a subgroup and so then also this is an example of a difference algebraic group. So a last example, I think it's a, a nice example, is some kind of a generic version of the unitary uh, group. So you take all invertible n times n matrices such that G and then sigma is applied here to every entry of the matrix and then you take the transpose and this should be the identity matrix. Okay, so you can you can spell this out, and you see that, of course, so you have n squared um, nonlinear algebraic difference equations in the matrix entries that are defining this group. And yeah, you can it's easy to check that this is also a subgroup of G and N, and so you have indeed uh, a difference algebraic group. And something interesting to note here is that in all these examples. Um, those this, these different algebraic groups are subgroups of uh, algebraic groups. Okay. So the definition does not um, 
say that this has to be the case. It does not Im immediately imply this. So in principle, the different, so here the, the multiplication in all these groups is somehow given by, uh, you know, actually by multiplication of, of matrices, uh, at least in the, the first two and the last examples. Um, but in principle, it, it is allowed in the definition of a different algebraic group that the multiplication is described by difference polynomials. Okay. But this actually here, the multiplication is always described by polynomials. Okay, so we had earlier this equivalence of categories between difference varieties and finally difference generated K sigma algebras. But now, if you add um, a group structure on the left side, you may wonder what do you have to add on the right side? And so what you have to add is the structure of uh, Hopf algebra. Okay, so if, <clears throat> if you like Hopf algebras, then this is maybe a, a good uh, way for you to, uh, to understand um, different algebraic groups. So a K sigma Hopf algebra is, uh, it's just a Hopf algebra such that um, yeah, equipped with a sigma such that the Hopf algebra structure maps are uh, morphisms of different strings. It's a very uh, natural notion here. Okay. okay. And so there's um, <clears throat> this observation we made earlier about those examples always being subgroups of algebraic groups is not a coincidence. In fact, there is a, a general theorem which is, is not hard to prove and is very similar to a, a result about algebraic groups. So algebraic groups, you can also define it as a fine varieties with a group structure, but then one can also always show that they are isomorphic to subgroups of uh, <clears throat> some general linear group. And so something similar holds here. So every different algebraic group is isomorphic to a subgroup of some um, general linear group so of, for some n. So, okay, so defined by algebraic difference equations in the matrix entries. So all of the examples basically are of, of this form as we've seen earlier. All right, so here's somehow a, a summary on, um, on different algebraic groups or let's say the perspectives. So three different ways to, to think of them. So the first one is somehow the definition. Um, it's really as let's say groups defined by algebraic difference equation. So as, as functors, from K sigma, for formally we say, okay, it's functor from K sigma algebra to groups that have this particular property that they can be described by algebraic difference equations. The second one is purely algebraically. You have those finitely sigma generated K sigma Hopf algebras. And then the third one is now somehow related to this theorem that you can always embed those groups into GLN. And this is now somehow a more let's say a more dynamical perspective um, so that you can always realize those groups in, inside GLN. And so you can, all the, these groups can always be viewed as closed subgroups of, um, so you're looking at now sequences of matrices. And so this, if, okay, so let's maybe think, think first of, of the second point. So if you have um, this K sigma Hopf algebra, then may, maybe you forget the sigma for a moment, then you just have a Hopf algebra. And so Hopf algebras are, um, they do not correspond in general to algebraic groups. They correspond to what people call uh, affine group schemes. So these things are not a finite type anymore. But so like GLN to the N, this is not an algebraic group, but it's still an affine group scheme. There is still a Hopf algebra uh, describing this. And so if you somehow forget the sigma and just look at this underlying group scheme of this, uh, of the Hopf, corresponding to this Hopf algebra, um, then you get a somewhat large group, but, and then it also, this group is somehow equipped with a sigma, but this can then always be arranged such that the group is a closed subgroup of some GLN to the N, 
and the sigma can always be be arranged in such a way that it it is uh, it becomes somehow just a restriction of this of this shift. Okay, that's a, a more somehow dynamic. So especially this is actually quite similar to what people somehow do in dynamics, and this is now on and also more related now to the uh, the talk to the talk in the to my second talk then later. So if you replace GLN, say with some some finite group or maybe even some finite set, then this kind of, of shift map is exactly what people look at in symbolic dynamics. So in some sense, this perspective is, a, is a, some kind of generalization of this uh, symbolic dynamics uh, approach. OK, so now this is um, basically the summary of uh, different algebraic groups. And so now I, I come to the last uh, topic. And so the goal here is to get some first rough uh, structure uh, theorem for uh, different algebraic groups. And so first, I need uh, a definition. Maybe we'd like to say, what is the dimension of a difference variety? Or let's maybe first say, what is the dimension of a finitely generated K sigma algebra? So it's a, it's a quite basic natural question. And so here is one way to do it. So there is a natural well-known notion of dimension for a finitely generated K algebra is called the cool dimension. So this is the dimension that is used here. And so we're fixing a, a finite generating set B and then I iterate Sigma only up to, to order I. And so I can look at this, at this cool dimension of this finitely generated algebra. And so here I have, you see, I'm start. I have here um, i plus one finite sets. So here is zero, one up to i. So this is i plus one. And so I'm taking some kind of average here. I'm dividing by i plus one, and then one can show that this limit actually exists. And so then I define the sigma dimension as this limit. And then one can also show that it does not depend on the choice of uh, the finite generating set. So that's the definition of, of the, it's some kind of dynamical version of dimension. Yeah. And so for example, as one may expect, the difference dimension of the difference polynomial ring in N variables is exactly N. Yeah, so for example, you just need to choose a good B. Of course, for B, choose the variables itself. And then you get, say for here for, for I equals uh, one, you get, um, 2n variables, and then you divide by 2, so you get n. So the sequence for b being the set of variables here would just be the constant sequence n. And so then, of course, also the limit is, is n. And so the difference dimension of a difference variety, we, of course, then just define it um, through the uh, difference dimension of the coordinate ring. And um, <clears throat> yeah, there's actually. Um, funny that this dimension, it does not need to be always be an integer. And I think it's, it's even an open question uh, which uh, numbers can actually occur here as the dimension. But one can show that for different algebraic groups, the dimension is always an integer. Okay. And so now working towards somehow um, defining basic building blocks for um, building general difference algebraic groups. We say that the difference algebraic group is strongly connected if it has positive difference dimension and the only difference algebraic subgroups of uh, the maximum difference dimension, uh, so the stigma difference dimension of T uh, is G itself. Okay, this is, so if you know a bit about algebraic groups then an algebraic group of positive dimension is connected if and only if the only algebraic uh, subgroup that has the same dimension as the group is G. So this is, um, so there's different versions of uh, connectedness for different algebraic group, but this is a rather strong one. And so that's why it's called strongly connected. And now a strongly connected different algebraic group is called almost simple. If for every normal difference algebraic subgroup N of G, either n is equal to g 
or the difference dimension of n is zero. Okay, so in terms of thinking of building blocks, so you know, so the classical Schrodinger Holder theorem tells you that a finite group can be somehow built up from uh, simple groups. Um, here, um, yeah, the, the, the no, the, maybe you first expect the notion of, of just being simple, which would then mean that every normal difference algebraic subgroup of uh, of G should either be G itself or, driv or a trivial group. But this is somehow too restrictive to be useful. So we're allowing um, still some very small um, normal subgroups. And so very small meaning they have difference dimension theorem. And so in analogy, in an analogy with uh, what people do in for algebraic groups, um, you, you would say that uh, an algebraic group, so let's say smooth and linear, um, but maybe this is too technical to get into, um, of positive dimension, we'd positive say dimension. that it, the dimension of an algebraic group is, is um, you could say it's the cruel dimension of the coordinate ring, but is, it is somehow the usual notion of dimension for varieties in the sense that GLN has dimension N squared, for example. Is that okay? So mm -hmm. that, that's the, 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 somehow this dimension corresponds to the intuitive di dimen notion of dimension for, like when you think of manifolds, it's kind of the same dimension people use for manifolds. Okay. So for algebraic groups, you would say they, they are almost simple if every normal algebraic subgroup of G is either um, the group itself or the dimension is zero. But typically people don't say dimension zero, they say that the, the group is finite, but that, that is uh, equivalent in this setup. Okay, and so for algebraic groups, those groups are completely understood. So there's the multiplicative group, the additive group, and uh, the non-commutative, um, almost simple algebraic groups, and those are completely classified. They are classified through the, the root uh, data. So there really is a complete list of, uh, of those groups. But yeah, so for, for different algebraic groups, we, we don't have that. But um, this is something um, which hopefully will be achieved in the, at some time in the future, at least, let's say. Okay, so now this is a, a general structure theorem for um, different algebraic groups, which is, is very similar to the classical Schoenholder type theorem. So we assume that G is a strongly connected different algebraic group. And so we decompose it somehow um, using a subnormal series. So subnormal series means that um, say G1 is a normal subgroup in G0, G2 would be a normal subgroup in G1 and so on. And so all those groups are strongly connected. They are different algebraic subgroups. And so the main point, the main property is then that the factor groups are uh, almost simple. And so there, there exists such a decomposition. So in this sense, any strongly connected difference algebraic group can be built up from almost simple difference algebraic groups. And in fact, so there's a notion of a strong identity component, which I don't want to get into. So this, whenever you have, so when you have a completely arbitrary difference algebraic group, you can look at it strong identity component, and then at least you can decompose the strong identity component in in this way. So this theorem applies so fairly generally. So you can always build up strongly connected different algebraic groups from those almost simple different algebraic groups. And if you do it in another way, so if you have another such subnormal series, then the length must be the same. So m equals n. And so you'd hopefully, so you'd hope that you can say that um, the factor groups are the same meaning that they are isomorphic, but that isn't, that isn't quite true. So you can only say that they are isogenous. And so now in the last slide, I'll try to explain what we mean by being uh, isogenous. So roughly it means they are the same up to sigma dimension zero. And also, so just in general, the philosophy of this general structure theorem for different algebraic groups 
you could maybe say it somehow means we understand them up to different dimensions theorem. So for example, so actually, so strongly connected in, included positive difference dimension. Uh, so this, this whole theorem doesn't say anything about difference algebraic groups of sigma dimensions zero. And so those are still uh, very interesting and uh, should be uh, further studied. But somehow up to this difference dimension zero, at least you have this uh, structure theorem. Okay, so let me explain what is isogeny. So it's somehow need to make formal what we mean um, by up to difference dimension zero. So uh, a subjective morphism of difference algebraic groups. So now think of it as a, some kind of quotient map of strongly connected difference algebraic group is an isogeny if the kernel has difference dimension zero. And now uh, you say that two strongly connected difference algebraic groups are isogenous if there exists another strongly connected difference algebraic group. And I said isogenous from the, the group on top to the other uh, two groups. And then one can show um, is a small lemma that isogeny is an equivalence relation. And so this is somehow formalizes this idea of, um, of things being equal up to different uh, dimensions zero. Okay. Yes, yeah, so now that we have this, this structure theorem, this kernel holder type theorem, that we can always decompose different algebraic groups, at least strongly connected different algebraic groups into these almost simple groups, it would be uh, nice to get some understanding of what actually those almost simple groups looks like. And um, so that is now then the, what this, this last theorem is about. So a strongly connected different algebraic group is almost simple if and only if it is isogenous to an almost simple algebraic group considered as a different algebraic group. Okay, so previously I already said that the almost simple algebraic groups, we completely know what they are. And so you can think of an algebraic group then as a different algebraic group. And then if you take an almost simple algebraic group, when you think of it as a different algebraic group, it will be almost simple as a different algebraic group. So this gives you examples of almost simple difference algebraic groups. And then That's the theorem right. says, well, more or less, so up to difference dimension zero, those are the only examples. Okay, so any, any almost simple difference algebraic group is isogenous to an almost simple algebraic group. So essentially, they're all coming from algebraic groups. But of course, the catch is somehow, again, in this, in this um, um, isogeny. So somehow, yeah. So it, it, so this is some kind of first classification you could say, but it's somehow very rough. It's only up to different dimension zero. It would be much nicer to have a classification of, say, at least of a certain class of difference algebraic groups, something like reductive difference algebraic groups in terms of some combinatorial data, like uh, some kind of root, difference root data, like you have a classification of uh, reductive algebraic groups in terms of, um, of uh, root data. So, but at, okay, at least this is some kind of first, um, yeah, let's say rough structure theory for different algebraic groups. Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to say. And if you're interested, in any details, here would be uh, two references. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, are there any questions for Michael from the audience? Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Uh, so, uh, Michael, I'm one of those people who don't know a lot about algebraic geometry. So could <laughs> you maybe, in the definition of strongly connected, which tells me about subgroups of maximal dimension. Could you comment on why that has this topological term connected in it? Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a good um, point somehow. Yes, so it, so, okay. So at least for, for algebraic groups, there is um, a natural 
um, there's natural topological notions. In fact, somehow, you know, because we have this, we have this, um, we chose this functor approach somehow, is not, is not that, uh, at least on a formal level, a different such algebraic group is not a group with uh, additional properties because it's not just an underlying set. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's also not, on a formal level, it's not a topological group, like it's not a topological space somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you cannot a priori really use topological notions straight somehow in a completely straightforward fashion. But there is, um, there is something you can do um, towards um, topology. And then that this is then, um, it's not exactly easy to uh, explain um, without using um, any terms which, um, which are not somehow um, restricted to experts, but let, let me try to do it. So if you have a Hopf algebra, then do a Hopf algebra, there is naturally, it's, it's possible to naturally associate uh, a topological space. And uh, the way mm -hmm. you would do it is, okay, on a formal level, it's just a set of prime ideals somehow. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it and this, this set carries the Sariski topology. Um, so it's like a spectrum of a ring. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's the spectrum of a ring. Yeah. So you just take the spectrum of, of, of the ring. And so that is, is a topological space. But, mm -hmm. And then because, and so then already for, for that topological space, you can talk about uh, notions of, uh, of connected components. And somehow because you have the, the group has an identity element, and then there is a particular uh, prime ideal corresponding to that identity element. And then you can talk about the connected component of that identity element. So there at least in this sense, there is this, this notion of connectedness. But then there's also other notions of connectedness because somehow the Hopf algebra, it came with a sigma. And then so also this spectrum comes with a sigma. So you have a continuous map on this spectrum. And then you can also use on this, um, on this uh, topological space, then with the endomorphism, you can use what I would probably call some kind of a sigma topology. So you say the closed sets of the sigma topology are the closed sets which are stable under sigma. And then you can, so this is a topology and then you can look at um, connected components with respect to this topology. Yeah. And, but however, so this, so there's actually at least three notions of, of connectedness in, mm -hmm. uh, in for different algebraic group. And two of them I just explained. <laughs> and so the third one would be this strong connectedness, which really does not, at least to my understanding, it does not correspond to anything um, topological. This is more, is really more kind of like an algebraic property. But right. so the thing is, if you take somehow the, the algebraic analog, then it, it corresponds to the usual notion of connectedness. So if you take an algebraic group, so usual algebraic group, where um, there is somehow a natural notion of topology. So typically, if you think of an algebraic group, just think of it as, so just take the points in an algebraically closed field, and there you have the, the Sariski topology. So that, that's the, the, the natural topology to use. Mm -hmm. And then an algebraic group, um, it always only has finitely many connected components. And uh, indeed, those are irreducible um, with respect to the Sariski topology. And so then there is, uh, Again, then you have the identity element, and so you can look at the uh, connected component of the identity element. And for an algebraic group of positive dimension, um, so. Yeah, is it true then that in that case, the connected component of the identity is a group and it has no lower dimensional subgroups? Exactly, that is true, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. That is true, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll take that. Thanks. Okay, great. <laughs>
Okay. Any other questions for Michael? Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Michael. Uh, Joy hey. um, Thanks for your nice overview. Um, you had an example where you were where you calculated the dimension where where the sort of was fairly obvious. Do you have a less obvious example that um, might tell us more about how the segment? Yeah, is yeah, I can, I can. Um, let I can try to do it. Let me get this here. So I'll stop sharing uh, this. And I'll share uh, something else, which actually, yeah. So this this is the slides for. So I'm not gonna do actual slides for my. Oh, what happened? Why is this gone? Um. So yeah. So I'm I'm just gonna hand write on the. On the second uh, talk, can you see this? What I'm writing? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. Yes, yeah, so there is um, maybe I can do an example of a different um, algebra that has a dimension one over two, which is maybe uh, somewhat curious. Um, so take R to be the difference polynomial ring just in one variable. And then you mod out somehow what we would call the, the difference ideal um, generated by the <coughs> equation. Um, but this would be the difference idea generated by y times sigma y. And so somehow really as an ideal, this would be y sigma y and then you also apply sigma so you have sigma y uh, sigma squared y and sigma cubed y uh, no sorry sigma squared y sigma cubed y and so on so this that would be the difference algebra and i'm claiming that the that i mentioned here is one over two and maybe I shouldn't do the, the full formal calculation, but let me try to give an intuitive reasoning why this is somehow uh, meaningful to have this. Because so if you rewrite this equation, if somehow it's a stupid equation, um, people wouldn't look at this difference equation usually, but if you rewrite it um, in a sequence notation, it, um, it means this. Okay, so you're looking, you're really just looking at sequences such that even think of sequences of complex numbers. Yeah, you're just looking at sequences. Really, what is this equation telling you? You're looking at sequences such that at least every second term is, is zero. And so the the way we define the difference dimension, if you in if you think in terms of these um this sequence solutions, roughly the interpretation should, should be that um, the difference dimension somehow measures the degrees of freedom that you have in choosing. So, so given somehow, say you already chose y1, y2, up to uh, yn minus one. So you already choose, chose your, your sequence and, and then you, you, you wonder how much degrees of freedom do you have in, in choosing your, your next element in the sequence based on what you already chose somehow. And that's what the difference dimension is some, somehow supposed to, to measure. <clears throat> and so here somehow, well, if your yn was, if your yn is zero, then you're completely free to choose yn plus one. But if your yn was non-zero, then you have to choose your yn plus one to be zero. So somehow, every other entry you can choose completely freely. But um, yeah, only every other. So roughly half of the entries you can choose freely. The other half is then somehow determined. So that's why it's somehow reasonable that the difference dimension comes out as, as one half. Yeah. So 
yeah. So it's, it's somehow natural. So yeah. So so first of all, somehow, so this difference dimension is is quite well behaved in in some regards in the sense that um, if the difference algebra is generated by an element, then the difference dim dimension will be bounded by by n. So here I have one generator. So it's clear that the difference dimension should be bounded by by one. Um, but then also it shouldn't, it really shouldn't be zero because somehow this this as an algebra, this is still fairly large. So it's not it's not finite dimensional as uh, as uh, k vector space. It does not have finite. Uh, it does not even so this algebra does not have finite cruel dimension so it's uh, yeah it, it's it makes sense that the difference dimension is not zero and so really it it somehow made sense that it that it's in the in the middle yeah. and so you can um do somewhat more interesting examples here um of the of some some product and i think if you do um something like um Let's say y um, sigma. Okay, let's say I do sigma alpha one of y uh, sigma alpha two of y, and so sigma alpha n of uh, of y, and so I look I look at the difference ideal generated by this, and then um, I look at this uh, difference algebra. So I want to know what is the sigma dimension here. And so where um, alpha one, less than alpha two, less than alpha n are just um, natural numbers, then there is, um, this is actually, a, um, so if let's say A is, is this set of alphas, um then there is some kind of uh covering some kind of co additive combinatorics invariant associated to this number which uh, to this finite subset of integers called the uh, covering uh, covering density of a or maybe it's 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 one minus yeah i think the sigma dimension of of this r is one minus the covering density of A, which very roughly, let me try to give you the idea of what is the, the covering density. So you have the in, you have your integers here. And of those integers, you have you chose, let's say I chose those those three alphas. <clears throat> and then now you're looking at translates, looking at translates of those those alphas, and roughly you asking, okay. On average, how many translates of this set A do I need to cover all the natural numbers? And so this is this uh, covering density. So there's this connection between the difference dimension and this um, of this very particular difference algebra and this somehow combinatorial um, thing of uh, related to the exponents here. Okay, I hope that there was some uh, interesting example. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a nice example. All right. So, thanks for the for the explanations, Michael. I think we can thank Michael for the talk and give him a bit of a break before the second talk. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>